Hello, my name is Andrew Marsh. I'm a Senior Licensing Executive in TU Dublin Hothouse. I'm happy today to present our third session in our series on creating a spin-out. In previous uh, workshops, we've talked a bit about your motivations, about how to develop out a business model, and in later sessions, we're going to talk about getting funding for your spin-out and the roles and responsibilities of being a director and other practicalities. Today's session very much focuses on the practicalities of creating a spin-out within TU Dublin. So we're going to talk a bit about the TU Dublin processes, the policies. I'm going to be joined by some of my colleagues, so Isabella Nedanova and Suzanne Martin from the IEO Group are going to talk about their experience in founding a company, Optrace. And we have Dan Barry, who's going to talk about his experience setting up a company, Rift Station, and another startup that he created. VRX Audio. If you have any questions, just pop them in the chat and myself and the panel will address them at the end or you can just wait and ask them in person at the end. So the first thing I want you to think about, you're a, a, a PI, a researcher, you're working in your lab or at home and you come up with a great idea for a business or a great new technology that you think could form the basis of a spin-out company. What are the first steps you have to take? How are you going to get the support and the buy-in from TU Dublin? The very first thing you should do is you should approach the staff at, in Hothouse or our colleagues in Link or in Synergy and you'll be assigned a licensing executive or case manager who will help you throughout the entire process. You will arrange a meeting with them and the output of that first meeting is likely to be some actions for you and some actions for your case manager. Um, the actions that you'll take will be around the validation, some initial validation of the idea. So maybe some basic market research, talk to a few potential customers. And usually we'll ask for a formal invention disclosure form to be submitted so that we have a very clear idea of the intellectual property and the technology in question. Your case manager will help you with developing out a very basic business model canvas, which was covered in the previous session. It's just not a full business plan. We don't need to know exactly how your business would operate, but a business model canvas that would capture the main points of how the business would operate. Once you're developed to that stage, you'll now be ready to pitch to the staff within TU Dublin and some external mentors or advisors. Now, just to be clear, the idea behind this pitch is you're not pitching for funding. You're pitching for feedback on your idea. The group will look at where you are, where your technology is, what your team looks like, and identify the gaps that will need to be developed before you're going to be ready to spin out. And this feedback and working through your case manager, this will form the basis of an action plan to get you from where you are to be ready to spin out. And it can make it sound quite trivial and simple here. You just execute on that uh, action plan with the support from TU Dublin, and then you're ready to spin out. I want to talk a little bit about the supports then that TU Dublin can offer. Why would you come to us for support? Why, do, why wouldn't you just go away and create this spin out yourself? First of all, one of our core areas of expertise is around the management of intellectual property. We can help you develop out a very, very clear IP strategy for your spin out. We can help protect IP through filing of patents, which we can pay for right up to the point of being spun out. We can liaise with patent agents. We can advise on confidentiality agreements, put in place confidentiality agreements, and manage those legal and IP aspects. To get your business ready to spin out, it's very, very likely you're going to require funding. That funding can come in through the likes of the EI Commercialization Fund, could be from other funding agencies. We can help with those funding applications. We can help you describe to those funders how your business is going to operate so that they will give you the funding that you need to develop out your business. With that funding will come the opportunity to build out a team. It's going to be crucial that you're going to have to have a team with a wide variety of skills and expertise. And we can help build out that team. We have a wide network, particularly in the business sector. We can work with Enterprise Ireland to bring in business partners for your business as potential CEOs. We have a full-time marketing manager who can help with marketing and promotion and profiling of your business, right up to the stage of spin-out and afterwards. We can help promote your business within the university and externally through social media channels, through events 
and other ways. We run formal entrepreneur training programs uh, across in, in, in Blanchardstown, in Talla, and in city centre. The main entrepreneur training programme we run is the New Frontiers programme, um, which can help develop you or somebody on your team with the entrepreneurial skills necessary to start the business. We can assist you with market research. We can link you in with Enterprise Ireland, who have funding for market research consultants, who can help develop out the commercial proposition for your business. And we can help in general with business planning and expertise for your business. And of course, it's going to be very important for your business once it goes to spin out to get investment. We can help with introductions to investors, help train you and guide you and support you in pitching to those investors. And there are other supports. For every spin out opportunity, we will put in place a custom set of supports. So it's very difficult for me to describe a one size fits all approach. Now, of course, we are a university and we operate, we're taxpayer funded and we operate within an environment of regulation rules. So I just want to give you a quick overview of the sort of the main principles that will apply if you are creating a spin-out through the university. Within TU Dublin, we have the intellectual property policy. I'll give you a very brief overview of some key elements of that. If you are thinking of creating a spin-out, it's well worth reviewing this document. It's, you know, it's not an exciting read, but it is what governs how we operate when we're creating spin-outs and licensing out intellectual property. And at a national level, we operate according to a document called Ireland's National IP Protocol. Again, there's a good bit of information that on creating a spin-out, what are the norms, what are the expectations of investors and so on, well worth reviewing if you are considering going down this route. Two key elements of the IP policy that I want to highlight. The first is around IP ownership. In certain cases, staff own the IP that they create, and in other cases, the university owns the IP that staff create. Very much depends on how that work was funded, what resources were used and so on. But regardless of which of those two situations we are in, if you want to unlock all these supports from TU Dublin, you will need to assign the IP to the university. We cannot invest state time and funding into a project without the university having ultimate ownership of the IP. And secondly, around conflict of interest. So there can be conflict of interest if you are joining or being involved in a, in a spin-out company. Will that spin-out company have an ongoing relationship with the university? Will it look to use lab space, office space? Will it look to recruit staff? These are all common issues. They can all very easily be dealt with. But it's very, very important that you declare through your school and through your college and faculty this conflict of interest or potential conflict of interest that you might have in being involved in the spin-out. TU Dublin will have some expectations in return for the, all these supports. So the one thing that people are usually very interested in is, is the university going to take an equity position in my spin-out company? And our policy is very clear. We typically look for around 15% equity in your company at foundation, with the expectation that investment is going to come in and we are going to dilute along with the other founders. This isn't a hard 15%. It could be more, it could be less. It will be negotiated depending on the nature of the IP, the nature of the, how the business is going to operate. Formal approval for a spin-out company is given by the university's IP committee. I'm going to take you through what that IP committee will have in terms of expectations around information and how developed the business plan will be. So first of all, before the university will sign off on a spin-out, we need to have a very clear business plan. And that's going to be developed by you and us through this action plan that we have discussed and I'll go into more detail. There will be a license agreement around the IP from the university into the spin-out company. And we'll require some information prior to the founding of the company. We need to understand very clearly exactly what IP is being licensed into the spin-out so that we know that that IP cannot be, for example, licensed to other companies, cannot be exploited in other ways. We need to understand very clearly who the founders of the companies are and what are their roles going to be. And this is particularly important if the founders are staff members. And we need to know what is the ongoing relationship of the spin-out with TU Dublin, if any. So many of our spin-outs rent incubation space. Many of our spin-outs have ongoing research projects, which is good. We're happy to do this. We want to have these ongoing supports. But it all has to be done very clearly, upfront, and everybody has to understand exactly the nature of the relationship between the two entities. And for all our spin-outs, we like to have regular quarterly meetings with the founders just to see how we can continue to help the company, 
what stage the company's at to address any different issues that may have arisen since foundation. I talked earlier about this action plan, so how we're going to get you from, from initial idea or slightly validated idea where you've talked to a few customers, maybe it's just yourself on the team, to the stage where you're ready to spin out and look for investment. So there'll be three core elements of this action plan. And the first and probably the most important is going to be around the team. For example, do we need to bring in a CEO for your business? How are we going to fund that, that CEO? Perhaps the researcher themselves has the skills and capabilities to be developed into a CEO. Is there specific training that we could, we could give you? So we'll have a very, very clear plan of how we're going to develop that team to the stage where you're ready to spin out. Secondly, around the technology and the intellectual property. Is there going to be substantial technical work that needs to be done before an investor is going to be ready to invest in this business? This is often the case. We often put ideas through the likes of the EI commercialization fund or other funding, proof of concept funding streams, to de-risk the technology to the point where investors are ready to put their, their hands in their pockets. We'll also have to put in place a clear strategy around patenting and intellectual property and an action plan. So a typical one might be to file a patent, to maintain a patent for a certain period of time to give you the opportunity to develop out your business. And thirdly, the action plan is going to have commercial elements, particularly around market validation and business model development. There will be supports to help you on this. Through different funds, we may be able to bring in commercial leads. We may be able to have consultants who can come in and advise your business, mentors who can help. But to be honest, a lot of this commercial work and this commercial validation will have to be done by yourself as the driver of this spin out. Again, there's no one size fits all action plan. Very different technologies and very different teams need very, very different approaches. But we will work with you to agree a plan to get you to spin out. And the final step then, when you've put in place this action plan, you're ready to set up a company. And there will be a later session where uh, Shane Costello, who's a solicitor with Holmes, is going to come in and talk a little bit about company formation and the roles and responsibilities, being a director and so on. But just to be clear, to create a spin-out, you will actually have to set up a limited company. TU Dublin can help you with that process. We uh, engage an outside firm who can help with the company registration. You will have to decide on who the directors of the company are going to be and who the shareholders are going to be. And the final step then, once the company is founded, is you're going to have to negotiate license agreements and shareholders agreements with the university and with other potential investors and stakeholders. So the university will license IP into your company. TU Dublin will negotiate that on behalf of TU Dublin. And you, our solicitors, our advisors to, that, to the startup company, will have to negotiate that on behalf of the startup company. Thanks so many for your attention. That was just a very quick overview of the processes and policies and how you go about setting up a spin-out company within TU Dublin. The key takeaway is, if you have an idea, if you wish to get down this road, reach out to ourselves in Hothouse, to the link, or to Synergy, and we'll be able to advise you all the way through the process. I'd like to hand you over now to Dan Barry, who is a founder of Rift Station, who's going to talk about his journey in creating a spin-out company. Hi, my name is Dan Barry, and I'm going to be talking about a startup I created from my research. Like most uh, research-generated startups, I started my, uh, my journey by starting a PhD in the Technological University of Dublin. And the area that I was studying was an area called sound source separation, which is a uh, niche area of digital signal processing. And the problem that I was attempting to solve was a problem whereby you have a recording of a piece of audio. It could be multiple speakers uh, all speaking at the same time, or it could be multiple instruments playing in a mix. The problem I was trying to solve was how can we take one recording of that mixture and then somehow extract out each of the individual sources. So I started my research in 2003, and within about a year, uh, I started producing publications and I published in, in the area that I just described and a couple of other areas. But pretty quickly it became apparent that uh, one of my publications, it was actually my first publication, uh, turned out to be uh, quite unique. So thinking that this was the case, I took uh, some demos and the publication to Hothouse and we reviewed it together and we determined that it was 
unique enough to at least attempt to patent. And so we engaged the services of a patent attorney and we set about applying for the patent. And uh, pretty soon it became apparent that it, it was likely going to be granted. Uh, all, the, all the signals were pointing us in that direction. So after we had gotten uh, all of that out of the way, uh, we set about trying to commercialize the research that had been patented. And again, a hothouse uh, came in and we identified the first area we would attempt to do commercialization in. And this was around 2005. So we decided that the most lucrative area at that point in time would be the telecoms industry. And we set about trying to pitch the technology to uh, phone providers and telcos as a means to achieve noise reduction in mobile phone communications. So we hit up a few of the, the usual suspects, including Nokia uh, and a company called Electrobit, who were an OEM for Siemens and Sony, and uh, a couple of other uh, headset manufacturers at the time. And the demos went down really well. Uh, they were very impressed with the, the level of noise rejection that was available with the, the algorithms we'd created. But the problem was that DSPs, the chips on the phones back in 2005, they weren't really yet advanced enough, uh, or the phones at least weren't stocking chips advanced enough to run uh, our DSP without really draining the battery. And the battery was another problem because cell technology at the time was also not quite as advanced as it became after feature phones uh, came online. So uh, we concluded that we were too early to that market and we had to go back to the drawing board. So in the meantime, I continued on doing research and uh, I decided uh, along with two of my colleagues, uh, Mikhail Gaintha and David Dorn, that we really should pool our expertise and try and generate uh, a kind of a larger entity and so we created the Audio Research Group in 2006. And with the funding of Enterprise Ireland and some funding from the European Framework Programme, we, we got a few projects up and running in the area of speech and audio enhancement and music information retrieval. So my own research was now coupled uh, with research from other researchers in the group and we had more to work with in terms of looking for commercialization opportunities. So throughout all this, we maintained a close relationship with Hothouse and we looked for opportunities. Uh, we looked for funding uh, possibilities and um, commercialization projects with other companies. And then in 2006, uh, purely serendipitously, I was sitting at my desk one day uh, during the summer uh, in TUD and the phone rang and it was Sony Computer Entertainment Engineering London and we hadn't been in contact with them before. They called, they said they had read one of the papers that we published, it was actually that first paper that generated the patent and they said we think your technology might be a viable solution for a problem that we have. So we signed NDAs and we set about exploring their problem. And at that time, they were just about to launch uh, a new version of the PlayStation, the PlayStation 3. And they were putting out a new version of their uh, big game, SingStar. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to be able to take commercial music recordings and remove the vocals in real time uh, without having to go back to the recording studio and remix the track. Now, Sony themselves actually had uh, quite a lot of technology around this, having built karaoke machines for years, but they didn't have uh, a technology which gave them the fidelity, the quality that they wanted after you stripped off the vocals. It normally left the rest of the recording uh, quite uh, lacking, for the want of a better word, in terms of quality. And so uh, we engaged in a pilot project with them. They sent us some test material. We uh, processed that test material. And eventually, after some focus groups, they determined that 
the quality was high enough and that they wanted to license the technology. So they did indeed license the technology and it's still in the PlayStation to this day in the audio processing pipeline. Uh, and it was the first commercial success that I'd had personally and that the group had had. Uh, and it was also quite a, a big name for Hothouse at the time as well, given that Sony was the, uh, the licensor. So uh, that kind of set us on a slightly different path in so far as we shifted our focus from purely academic research to more commercial research then. And we started looking for startups and the startup scene in Dublin was also becoming quite vibrant. We started looking for startups to partner with and license our technology to. Uh, at the same time, we, you know, we, we uh, had academic commitments. So we grew the team to 13 researchers and produced masters and PhDs from those researchers. We produced in excess of 80 publications. Uh, and some of the startups that we did find throughout the, the time, we licensed technology to. Uh, but ultimately, unfortunately, unfortunately, none of them uh, succeeded. Uh, at the same time, we were facing into an economic crash between 2007 and 2010, and it made the, the funding uh, environment in all universities quite challenging. So at that point in time, having had a lot of exposure to startups uh, and having had a lot of exposure to, uh, you know, technology and, and pushing technology into startups, we decided that now was as good a time as any to uh, spin out something of our own. And so that's exactly what we did. And in 2011, uh, Mikhail Gayenta and I decided we would spin out into a company of our own called Rift Station. And we pooled our resources. Mikhail had been uh, researching mainly in the area of music information retrieval. I was researching mainly in the area of uh, audio enhancement or um, audio processing, real-time audio processing. And together we uh, came up with this idea that we could rival some of the music education tools that were already on the market. Music was a passion of both of ours, so mixing that passion along with our tech skills, we came up with RiffStation. Uh, so again, we went back to Hothouse, this time to actually license the technology uh, that we had generated in the university to license it out into our own spin-out. And RiffStation was, a, was a, a great success. I'll just run you through some of the, the, uh, the, the various different um, parameters of the, the software. So essentially it was music education software. We used to kind of market it as Guitar Hero for real. It was predominantly self-learners, uh, also some educators, people who were teaching other people, uh, online guitar uh, tutors and in-face guitar tutors, and professionals. We had quite a lot of professionals from well-known bands who would use the tool as a way to practice and get ready for sets, particularly session musicians. So our sales channels were all online. It was, it was a B2C product, direct to customer. We didn't have any physical product, so we created the software once and then distributed it to as many customers as we could. Uh, we didn't hire a sales team uh, predominantly because we didn't have the funding at that point in time. So as the founders of the company, we switched hats, uh, which is something which often happens, where we got ourselves uh, up to date on all the, the new trends in digital marketing and sales. And uh, we became experts in all things digital marketing uh, around 2011, 2012. And it was the start of the kind of digital marketing revolution. Google ads had been around for a while, but YouTube pre-roll ads were relatively new. Facebook ads were relatively new. There was a lot of different ad networks and, and types to choose from. And we, we dived deep into them all and tried them all. Ultimately, we found a combination that worked for us uh, a combination of Google display ads and YouTube pre-roll ads. And we ended up uh, essentially selling in uh, over 150 countries and we had uh, millions of users by the time we had rolled out the software from the original offering, which was Mac and Windows. And we rolled it out to iOS and then to web. 
as well. So, uh, as I said, we, we managed to uh, get it to the stage where millions of people were using the software, uh, mainly on the free product, but we also had revenue coming in from the, uh, the desktop product, the Windows and Mac product, and we were able to grow the team from three people uh, to seven people. Ultimately, we bootstrapped it for the first three years because we generated revenue pretty quickly. Uh, and then in year three, we decided in order to, to kind of do a bit of a kind of a leap in growth that we were going to have to take on some investment. So we took a small seed round uh, from a local investor and that allowed us to uh, just grow to the next level. So at that point in time, we started asking ourselves, OK, are we going to continue on this road of uh, getting more and more funding, Series A, Series B. It's quite competitive. It's a B2C product, which is always difficult to, to generate kind of large-scale revenue without a lot of investment. Uh, or should we start thinking about strategic partnerships? So in 2014, we uh, started talking to software companies, guitar companies, big multinational companies, did a tour of Silicon Valley, uh, met with most of the big companies there. And by the end of 2014, it was clear that there were, at that point in time, two kind of main uh, interested parties who were interested in more than just uh, strategic investment, they were interested in acquisition. And ultimately, by the end of 2014, it became apparent that uh, Fender was the most mutually beneficial company uh, for us to partner with. And so we went through a, a period of negotiation and, and uh, discussion with them about what an acquisition would look like and where the team would be based, uh, various things like that. And ultimately, by the end of 2014, without using an M&A team in this case, because it was a relatively small deal, um, we came to an agreement on what the final deal would look like. And by April uh, of 2015, we were uh, acquired by Fender. So we had uh, arranged as part of the, the deal that we wanted to stay in Dublin. Uh, so they were uh, obliging and, and let us grow the team from Dublin. So we grew the team in Dublin from seven at that point in time to 13. And we continued to grow the product uh, under Fender and users grew and we, uh, we uh, rebranded it and we added features and the product was uh, a very well-loved product uh, and we also began working on new products inside Fender and ultimately it was a, it was a very rewarding uh, period of the journey. But uh, ultimately in 2018, uh, I decided that I had uh, done all I could do uh, with Rift Station uh, in Fender and new ideas uh, were entering uh, my mind and the, the general field of technology was moving on and I decided I wanted to go again. So I left Fender in 2018 and first of all decided I was going to finish the PhD that I had not finished. Uh, when deciding to commercialize uh, the research in the first place. So I managed to do that uh, and also uh, form another startup, VRX Audio, in the area of spatial audio. I also uh, rolled out uh, another product called Go Listen, which is a, an online listening test survey platform, which is starting to gain traction now and lots more ideas in the pipeline. So that's my journey from research to commercialization. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, Dan, for sharing your story with us. And next up, we have Isabella and Suzanne from Optrace. Hello, uh, I'm Suzanne Martin, and I'm going to be talking today, along with my colleague Isabella Nedenova, about our experience in spinning out a company uh, from TU Dublin. I'll be speaking a bit about the background of our research centre in TU Dublin and then I'll hand over to Isabella who'll be talking a bit more about the stages in, the, in our experience of spinning out the company. So first, um, this is just a slide about our centre, the Centre for Industrial and Engineering Optics. 
and we're, our background is in optical and, and photonic materials uh, and we develop technologies that are based on holographic techniques. We've been around for a long time, 25 years, and we've graduated quite a lot of PhD and MSc students, but what we're talking about today, I suppose, is why we're, we were interested in, in spinning out some of those technologies and forming a spin-out company. The centre itself is aligned with the Focus Research Institute and is based in the School of Physics and Clinical and Optometric Sciences. So initially our focus was very much on postgraduate teaching and supervising PhD and MSc students, but we became more interested in a more outward looking approach where we would engage more with companies and we got some Enterprise Ireland grants that helped us to, to look at developing some of our technologies into actual you know, products and, and look at commercialisation of the things that we were actually doing research on. We have a wide range of funders, uh, we have SFI, IRC, uh, still Enterprise Ireland as well, and um, also some we're partners in some EU projects. So this is the current team, um, six staff and nine postgrads, but soon to be, we've just hired a postdoc, so soon to be seven staff, and then we have three more PhD students starting very shortly as well. In the early days, impact was really only through peer-reviewed publications and the very um, standard ways of interacting in the research community, but now, of course, there's an emphasis on, on as broad an impact as possible, and we have various ranges in which our research impacts on um, the community. And, you know, one of those ways is in, in having made our spin-out company and others are more traditional, like supervising our PhD students and peer-reviewed publications. But it's safe to say that the spin-out company has, um, has had a, a positive impact on all of these, actually, impacts. You know, the fact that we have a company now that can develop technologies helps us in, in developing new technologies because we can say there's an immediate route to market for anything that we develop. We've already overcome an awful lot of the obstacles technically that are in the way of getting our technology from lab to a commercial company. For example, the PhD students that we have have a benefit from interacting with the spin-out company. The research that we do is positively influenced in a direction that makes it more useful by us having a knowledge of what the market is and what the market needs and interacting that way. Uh, and then, of course, there's more of an emphasis on us um, producing patents and taking care to protect any IP that we do have because it could have uh, potential commercial benefit for the company. And then even peer-reviewed publications, which is the more standard thing that we used to focus on, has benefited from us having our spin-out company because we have specific publications that we've put together on the mass production methods and technical areas that, that were developed only because that company existed. Um, so yeah, just to give an overview of how it's kind of impacted um, research in general for us. So what we're going to talk about specifically today is, is the spinning out of our company Optrace. Um, and this slide is really just to show that we've had quite a long timeline into getting to, you know, from uh, the very earliest research in this area to the company existing and then uh, landing its first um, big customer, for example. So uh, there would have been uh, many years of research beforehand and then a point at which this particular technology was identified, and Isabella will talk more about that. Our, we found that our experience in commercially focused research was very helpful. Uh, we had have interacted a lot with companies. We understood where companies were coming from in a way that we hadn't at earlier dates just due to those projects. Uh, and we found that that was really good in being able to see things from the point of view of developing the commercial potential of something and not just looking at the research side. Um, and in, throughout this, Hothouse was a huge support at all stages, initially with the company agreements and then through to actually all the different stages of, of developing the spin-out. And I suppose just to finish up on my section in this, three reasons to be involved in commercialisation of research from the researcher viewpoint. Apart from the things that I mentioned about it really improving impact, it's just to be, for us anyway, from our perspective, was to be involved in creating jobs and strengthening the economy and then to add relevance to the research carried out in third level, you know, just making uh, what we, uh, focusing what, what research we do in a much more beneficial direction, and then also to, um, to increase the, the impact of the research activity. And now I'd like to hand you over to my colleague, Professor Isabella Nadenova. My name is Isabella Nadenova, and I'm going to talk today about my experience if, of co-founding a spin-out company called Optrace. Optrace is a TU Dublin spin-out company, and now I'm going to speak about uh, how we uh, went from the idea to the project to the spin-out company. 
So initially we had a, a number of very nice looking holograms, colorful and fancy, but we didn't really know what to do with them. And then we realized that with a little bit of support from funding agency like Enterprise Island, and after speaking to industry, we may be able to have a real product that it's interesting for the market. And the Optrace project, this is how the Optrace project started. And it had two types of main tasks. The third one, the first one was a technical work where we had to actually figure out how to take the work from the lab to a real product and think about mass manufacturing, which is the most difficult part actually for any spin out company. And then the other part was commercialization work where we needed to identify potential clients and mainly to find the routes to commercialization, whether to be through a spin-out company or licensing, because we didn't know at the start whether it's going to be a spin-out company. The technical work uh, laid ground to a process where we had uh, uh, some fancy looking hologram which had eight steps of preparation. The technical work uh, laid ground on a process which took eight ste steps of preparation of the uh, holograms, each taking uh, place in three different laboratories. And just for one hologram, it took 20 minutes to a, a place where in 2014, we were able for one shift to produce 15,000 holograms. And we had a fully uh, automated system to do that. The commercialization work was starting with the market research. And this involved finding the market trends uh, find it, finding the market size, what are the main competitors, and identify what additional value we can bring to the market. And also, most importantly, identifying industrial partners which will help us to develop the product. For all this to happen, we needed a lot of people to be involved. Initially, it all started with the research team, with uh, Professor Vincent Toll, who established the IEO Research Center, Suzanne and myself. Then at the stage where we were just figuring out what we have in terms of research, which has a commercial potential, there were uh, postgraduate students involved, postdoctoral students involved. Then we went to the process of prototyping, which is also a key process of attracting industrial players. And this then uh, needed more technical, more uh, stuff with engineering skills. And also to approach the industrial partners, we needed staff with uh, marketing skills. And all this, as you see, the different steps there on the slide, research team, inventors, prototyping team, spin-out team, and finally to, to reach the stage of independent company. A lot of people are involved and they need to be acknowledged. And during this process, very important is to keep track of who invented what, and uh, to have a fair uh, agreement on the remuneration of their work. Because this is uh, um, having an incentive, it's very important in the whole process. How did we become Investor 80? The first step was to become one of the first seven groups coming from universities in Ireland, uh, participating in the NDRC Venture Lab program. And during this process, which took a number of months, and in which we participated together with the CEO of the company. We identified the unique selling point of our product. We developed a business model. We looked at the market again, and we developed elevator pitch. At the end of this pro process, the company was established and the first investors were identified. The second process was technology development, which happened together with the first one, because we needed to demonstrate that we are capable of mass manufacturing. Then the next step was to demonstrate the technology to potential inventors. We identified the first inventors and we uh, hired our own premises. So what are the lessons that we learned from this process? Uh, the first lesson, which I probably didn't emphasize enough, but Suzanne mentioned, is that it is extremely important to work together in close collaboration with the TTO office, the Technology Transfer Office at the University, because they were guiding us through every step of the process. The second one is building a strong team with complementary skills. So you need really a diverse team, not just technical people, but you need someone who understands from marketing. You need engineers on your side in order to be able to demonstrate that you can mass manufacture. 
The other lesson is that you need a very strong IP position. You need to protect your intellectual property. We did this through uh, patenting. And uh, important point is that patent is not just to protect your commercial rights, but it also puts a stamp of quality of your work. Because to get a patent acknowledged and recognized and granted, this also acknowledges that your work is novel, innovative, and uh, no one else can do the same thing. The next lesson that we learned is that uh, you should keep a record in, of the inventors and their contributions because people leave and uh, the team is a very dynamic thing. So it's very important actually to keep a very good record of the inventions. And this is usually done through invention disclosure form uh, submitted to the TTO office. And it helps just to keep uh, record of the inventions and also to decide how the remuneration of the contribution will be done. And finally, uh, you have to work fast, you have to stay focused and you have to be flexible. Thanks for listening and I look forward to your questions.